Sunday. We're so excited to have you here worshiping with us and a special welcome if you're tuning in from the comfort of your couch. We're so happy to have you here today via live stream. If you are in person with us, please make sure to fill out a white connect card that's in the pew in front of you. Just fill that out legibly and get it into the offering basket so we can keep up to date with you. So after 32 wonderful years here at Trinity Preschool, um, we are actually saying goodbye to Marilyn Braxton, our director of our Trinity Children's Center here. We are so excited for her as she enters this wonderful new world of retirement, and we would love to be able to just bless her and congratulate her today during a reception in between services. So if you would like to join us in between services, that'll be at 10 a.m., and we're going to have some cake and just time to fellowship with her and celebrate her new beginning. Well, I cannot believe it. It is almost here. VBS is going to come up on June 4th through the 8th, and we need your donations. So please look in the bulletin to see that list, and those are the things that we are going to need to provide for our kiddos during that full week. And also, all of your prayers are appreciated for all of us leaders that are going to be taking on all of these wonderful children and just really inspiring them with the love of God within that Vacation Bible School week. So Memorial Day is coming up on Monday, so just remember that that means that the church office is closed and they will resume on Tuesday. So Memorial Day is Monday, so no one will be in the office if you show up. <laughs> Have you been trying to figure out a way that you fit in to be able to serve and you know be God's hands within the community here at Trinity? Well then, we have an awesome, awesome ministry fair for you on Sunday, June 3rd in the back hallway. So that's going to be just an area where you can find out about all of the different ministries that we have going on here at Trinity and find your way to be able to help serve. Thank you so much and we hope to see you there. And just a quick reminder, there is no more Wednesday night dinners, so they will resume on August 1st. They take a summer break, so they're going to enjoy the summer sun and we will see them back August 1st. And I think that's everything that I have. Of course, if I missed anything, please check the bulletin as well as your newsletter or the website to see everything that we have going on here at Trinity. We're so happy that you chose us to worship with today, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you this morning. Before we continue our service and pray before the service, I'm going to ask Bill Hassler to come. He's going to share some exciting things with us this morning about missions. Bill? Buenos dias, hermanos y hermanas. Gracias por ayudar nuestra iglesia hermana en Cuba. Oh, in English. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Thank you for helping our sister church in Cuba. My name is Bill Hassler, and I'm on the missions committee here at Trinity and the Cuba coordinator. Many of you may not be aware that we even have a sister church in Cuba. It is La Iglesia Metodista Arco de Fuego Nuevitas Cuba. In other words, the Methodist Church, Arc of Fire in Nuevitas Cuba. Nuevitas is about 374 miles from Havana, on the Atlantic side of the island, um, and it was founded in 1775. Our sister church is going to be celebrating its 100th anniversary this July 15th. The pastor is Pastor Luna Gallardo, who you see on the uh, picture there with his wife and congregation. Now, Matthew 24, 25, excuse me, chapter 40 says, I tell you the truth, whatever you do, for the least of these brothers of mine you did for me. As Christians, we're taught to help those in need. Accordingly, every Sunday our sister church invites families from around the neighboring areas uh, to their service. The children of these families are given a good meal and a Bible story. We call this the Feed the Children program. Generous donations from our church found, uh, funds this uh, wonderful outreach program. Mark 16, verse 15 says, And he said to them, Go into all the world 
and proclaim the good news to all creation. We're also taught to spread the good news about Jesus. Our sister church has 12 missionaries. These missionaries walk eight to 10 miles to their mission each way to their mission location. The only way they can do this, obviously, was walking because they weren't allowed to use automobiles. So can you imagine walking 16 to 20 miles in the heat of Cuba to fulfill your mission obligation? Uh, I don't know how many of us would be willing to do something like that. Now, you re may remember a while back we had uh, Bikes for Cuba fundraiser. And through the generosity of our church, we were able to provide bicycles for these dedicated missionaries to make their job a little bit easier. Pastor Luna and our sister church is working very hard to bring faith and hope to the oppressed people of Cuba under very difficult circumstances. Your continued support is helping to make this possible. Muchas gracias por su ayuda. Thank you, Bill. We are so blessed to have uh, a wonderful missions committee. We're supporting uh, many different ministries uh, on the missions field, and that was wonderful. Thank you. I'm so glad this morning that I only had to walk 100 yards to get here. I can't even imagine. Let us pray. Father, you are the one from whom every gift derives. And so today we gather to worship you. You are an awesome God, greater than our comprehension or our imagination. And Father, you're beyond any word that we could ever use to describe you. We've come to worship you this morning, to give place in our lives anew into your perspective. So today, we ask that you would enlarge our vision with your word. Father, that you would instill in us your hope in place of despair, your peace where hatred threatens, your joy amidst depression, and Father, your love overwhelming over apathy. And again, may your Holy Spirit surround and indwell this congregation. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen.
and our prayer for you is that you will feel revived during this service and when you leave this place. Our first hymn today is America the Beautiful. There will be an interlude between verse 2 and 3. So we'll let Jay play an interlude there and then we will come in on verse 3. During the choir anthem today, we're doing God Bless America. And after we sing it through once, I will stand you and you will join us in singing that at the very end. So let's stand and sing America the Beautiful. And now let us together affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
And before you are seated, turn and pass the peace of Christ to one another. Thank you, Shelby. Amazing Grace, one of my favorites. This morning, as we go to prayer, we want to continue to remember Chad Choate, Billy Dean, Marty DeVita and family, Lori Fetzer, Kenny Hawkins Jr., Hal Highstand, Howard Longstreet, Jim Martin, Tina Reinke, Carolyn Reynolds, Carmen Russell, Sally Wallace, and Gloria Warren. And again, let's please continue to be praying for uh, the people in our neighborhoods and communities that they would come to know Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father, today we are looking upon Memorial Day tomorrow and recognizing that Memorial Day literally calls forth so many different thoughts for us and feelings and memories within us all. Father, it reminds us of the precious gift of life that you have given us and how suddenly and tragically it can be taken. Too often we take it and all of the blessings you fill it with for granted. We get so consumed with living life that we sometimes forget how valuable life actually is. And Father, today we are grateful for those that you have sent across our paths who have encouraged, empowered, and inspired us. Thank you for friends and family members that have finished their journey in this life and now continue on their heavenly journey, that they have run the race, they have fought the good fight, and now rest with you in heaven. And Father, we are especially grateful for those who have sacrificed themselves for the sake of others in service to freedom's cause around the world. And we are most thankful for the life, the death, and the resurrection of your son, Jesus. Because he lives, we also have life. So Father, empower us today to follow his example by giving our lives in selfless service to others. And it is in the mighty name of your son, Jesus, that we pray as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you would focus on this lovely video before Pastor Mike. Thirteen folds. Each fold a reminder of a life spent in service. Service to country. Service to people. Protecting God-given rights. Preserving freedoms. Thirteen folds. At each fold, we remember the friends and family left behind. The mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers, sons and daughters left to pick up the pieces. 
13 fools. And we remember the scriptures. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Each one loved greatly. We also remember that blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And today we pray, God be near those who need comfort. So, draw close to those who mourn. Make your presence and appreciation known. Let this church be a safe place, a comforting place. And let us honor those who have given their lives in service to this country. Thirteen folds to signify a life given to service. Amen. Just a reminder to us that this weekend is about so much more than barbecues and gathering with family. You know, uh, the, thing, the reason why we chose that video was because of the very end of it, where it said, let this church be a safe place. A safe place for all of us who mourn, who grieve the loss of loved ones, especially those who have given their lives in freedom's cause. And that's one of the ways that, that we try to make a difference in the lives of others, is to, <clears throat> to be the hands and the feet of Christ for those that are suffering and those that are grieving and those that um, are struggling in their lives. I'm grateful for the ways that we're making a difference in the lives of the folks in Cuba, as Bill has shown us uh, so well earlier. The difference that's being made for the kingdom is, is really, it's immeasurable. Uh, and that's because of your faithfulness and your obedience to God. And I want to thank you for that. Thank you for the ways that you are making a kingdom difference in the world through your faithfulness and your obedience to God and your generosity of spirit. And so um, we rejoice in God's generous, generous spirit that has poured his life out for us. And so we seek to give our lives for his sake in this world. So let's pray as we receive our offerings this morning. Oh, Lord, our God, as we come before you today, uh, let these gifts be a reminder to us that you truly are Lord of all, Lord of our lives, Lord of everything we are and all that we have, and help us in our lives as we journey along to become ever more obedient and to grow in our ways of loving you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. And forgive us along the way. Remind us of your grace when we stumble and we don't get it right, but we know that you are there to sustain us for our journey. And so, Lord, take these gifts. Bless them and use them and let them uh, become for us a visible reminder of your constant presence and generous faithfulness in our lives. And we pray these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.
Our next hymn is We Are the Church. And I don't know if you've ever considered yourself the church, but you might be the, the best representative of church that someone knows. It's a big responsibility, isn't it? But this is a wonderful hymn. I am the church, you are the church. Let us sing. seated. Good morning, everyone. Looks like uh, about half of us are traveling today, doesn't it? <laughs> Our scripture today comes from three books of the New Testament, and we're reading from the New Living Translation. The Lord now chose 72 other disciples and sent them ahead in pairs to all the towns and places he planned to visit. These were his instructions to them. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. Now go and remember that I am sending you out as lambs among wolves. And from the fourth chapter of Ephesians, their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. And from the second chapter of Acts, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. 
a dense sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders, and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Before we begin the message, I want to take a, a moment right now and, and uh, recognize you, you heard it mentioned earlier that today we're going to be celebrating Marilyn Braxton uh, for, for her retirement after 32 years of service to our Trinity Children's Center. And Marilyn is right over here. So Marilyn, would you just stand and wave at everybody? This is and tell her thank you for the, the faithfulness and all of the ways that she has served and touched the children of our community. Think about uh, 32 years of service and the, the thousands of children who have been impacted by her ministry at the Children's Center, many of them in her own class, but uh, many others under her direction. And uh, what a difference that, what a legacy that is in our community of faithfulness. And all of those children that have been through that child care center have received uh, a Christian education and, and learned the stories of the Bible, uh, as well as their ABCs and all the other things that they need to go on to kindergarten. So um, what a wonderful and beautiful ministry that is. And so we celebrate you, Marilyn. <clears throat> and we thank you for your faithfulness. Would you pray with me? O oh Lord, your God, our, oh Lord, our God, we give you thanks and praise for your goodness and graciousness, for the, the mercy that sustains us and your strength that undergirds us. Fill us now with your Holy Spirit, O oh God. Take our minds and think your thoughts. Take our hands and do your will. Take our eyes and let us see others as you do. And take our hearts and set them afire with the power of your love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're in this series on making a difference, how to find your place of service and passion and allow those to connect, because God has created us and given us the challenge, the, the privilege, and the responsibility of uh, being his agents in the world, the, the, the primary means, with no plan B whatsoever, that God wants to reach and impact the world is through you and I, who are the body of Christ, that we have, as we've just celebrated in song. You are the church, and I am the church, all of us together. We are the church, and what is the church? It is the body of Christ, those gathered together around the central message of God's great love as revealed through Jesus Christ, his life, death, and resurrection, and has given us new life, that we have this, the gift and the privilege of offering that new life to others, to this world. Someone offered it to us. That's how we got to be where we are. And we have the privilege of offering others that same gift that we've been given. In Africa, there's a, the principle of Ubuntu. Uh, and and this is, print, this is uh, represented in a mural right in the Johannesburg airport. But the Ubuntu is the principle uh, that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. This is the first fill in the blank in your order of worship. So if you want to pull out your order of worship, this is the very first one. If you want to go fast... Go alone. I'll give you a minute. I hear a lot of rustling, so I'll give you a minute to pull it out. So if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. If you want to go far, go together. See, when we awaken the desire to make a difference, our hearts are softened and our eyes are open to the harsh realities of this world in which we live. And we get to see that, that there are many things in this world that are out of joint, 
And we know that this world is not the way that God wants them to be. Our response to this awakening is either to, to work even harder to, um, to work this out under our own steam or to give up in frustration because the needs are too big and we feel there's nothing we really could do to make a difference. It makes me think of uh, two different stories that come to mind when I think about that. One is, is the story of the starfish. You might have heard it before where uh, this, this young boy walks up to a beach and there are thousands of starfish that have washed ashore. And uh, the, the boy is out throwing the starfish back one by one and somebody walks up to him and says, what are you doing? They're, they're, you, know, you can't really make a difference. They're all going to die. They, you can't possibly throw all of these back. What difference are you making? And he picked up another one. He said, well, it makes a difference to this one. He threw it back. And to this one. And the whole principle of, you know, if, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. You know, the, it is a big task, but it's not a task that we are, we are called to accomplish on our own or under our own steam, or by our own motivation or inspiration, we are, we are given the gift of one another. We're given the gift of the Holy Spirit that God has given us. Now, we celebrated Pentecost Sunday last Sunday, and today is Trinity Sunday, where we celebrate the reality that, that God in His mystery has revealed Himself to us in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we, we, we understand, and we, we kind of understand somewhat the Father and and the Son, you know, that's Jesus. We kind of get that. But the Holy Spirit, that just, that Holy Spirit is just sort of like grasping at the wind. It's hard for us to understand. But yet, all three together are the presence of God in the world and the power of God in us. And so, as we get this Holy Spirit, we are given that the gifts that are needed within us, ourselves. We're given the, the life that we're needed that, that we need to have to, to make the difference that God calls us to make as we walk in obedience, learning along the way how to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and learning to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. The gift of community is evidenced in the beginnings of the creation. We see right there in the garden, God creates the human one and God says it's not good for that human one to be alone. And so he created... He created the woman. Later they got their names. It's a long, complicated theological construct I'm not getting into today. But it's Adam and Eve in the garden. And they were created for community together with God and each other, given as equals one to the other, to steward over the creation that God had created with His very Word. And we see it throughout the Scripture. We see it uh, in the Old Testament in the story of of Moses. Moses was, had led the people, led the children of Israel out of their bondage in Egypt, and, and the time had come where Moses has, has been set up as the judge over all of Israel, and, and everyone came to him to get their disputes mediated. And one day he had a visit from his father in law, and his father in law, Jethro, came to him with some advice. Have you ever been approached by your father in law with some advice? Not always wanted advice, is it? And in and, and the story, we don't get, uh, we, we don't get it represented that uh, Jethro asked Moses if it was okay to share something with him. He just went to him and said, it's not good for you to do this alone. You are no good to anyone by trying to do too much. And then he gave him a word of, of counsel. He said, divide up the responsibilities among those that are, un, you know, set up a council of those under you and, and, and allow the smaller disputes to be worked out by some of those that are under your supervision but not directly by you so that then you can take your time and focus on the, the big things that need your attention. Because if you don't do this, you're going to burn out and so Moses saw the wisdom in his father-in-law's advice, and, and that's w exactly what he did. And, and the people were happier, and Moses was happier, and leaders were empowered to make a difference because Moses was willing to realize that he could not do it alone. He needed help. 
the, the apostles learned it in Acts 6, Acts chapter 6, this, this newly formed community, as you saw in the Acts chapter 2 text that was read just a few moments ago, that this gathered community was growing daily. We had uh, 10,000 or more folks that were converted in the very first sermon by Peter, and more and more were added to their number each day, and they gathered together in community. And what happened is it said they sold and tried their, their possessions and were, were attempting to make sure that no one would be in need among them because most of them were pilgrims who had come to Jerusalem for this, the celebration of Pentecost. It was a pilgrimage festival. So these folks were, were from lands far and wide come to Jerusalem to celebrate. Here they heard the good news of Jesus Christ and they wanted to linger longer so they could learn more about who this Jesus was and, and all that he has come to be and do in their lives. But some of them along the way felt left out. The, the Greeks among them felt that their widows and their, their, their poor were being neglected. And they went to the apostles and the apostles delegated the responsibility and said, you know what, you're right, we need to, we need to fix this. And so they set up they set up a response, and that is they delegated the authority by creating something called the deacon. The deacon's role is to serve. And so as a result, all of the widows, Greek and Hebrew both, were, were fed and cared for and nurtured in a way that helped them to feel valuable. Paul makes it clear in the text from Ephesus that we had just read that God's purpose was to equip God's people for the work of serving and building up the body of Christ. It is not the responsibility of one or two people to do the work of the body. It is the body's responsibility to do the work of the body. And there are those of us that have been given the responsibility to equip others. But mostly the equipment comes from the Holy Spirit that dwells in us, that gives us the gifts, and our gifts are given. And, and here's the thing that a lot of us tend to overlook. Every single believer in Jesus Christ is given a spiritual gift. And the reason we're given that spiritual gift is so that we can be the most effective that we can possibly be in the ministry that God has entrusted to us within our given sphere of influence. And you think, well, I, I'm not in ministry. All of us are in ministry. Some of us are in vocational ministry, but all of us have a ministry, that ministry of reconciliation, of being the light and the love of Christ for the world to see so that it, they might be drawn into the beauty of his love and his goodness. And so we all have a share in that. It is not simply one person or some small group of people that are going out, that, that are charged with going out and doing it for everyone else. See, the, the examples that were given in the Bible is it points us to the, these Christ followers that try to set things right in this world learned not to try to do the work alone. They did it together. We're all in this work together. I heard a story recently of a young man who had no particular background in any sort of church or religious affiliation and uh, wound up spending a lot of his time um, wasted by drugs and addiction. And through a series of miraculous events, this young man uh, had picked up a Bible and he started to read it in, in the New Testament. And then he, then he especially was, was moved and captivated by the stories of the book of Acts, which is the story of those first Christians, the beginnings of the church. He saw the Holy Spirit transform the lives of those first followers of Christ. And, and in that that witness in, in reading those stories, he found the power to break free from his own addictions. He wanted to be like those early Christians and to be a part of a, of a congregation that, that impacted the community the way the early church impacted the world in which they lived. And so he went and he found a local church. And the first church that he visited was full of, of kind-hearted, well-intentioned what Jim Harnish calls rocking chair disciples. They were comfortably rocking back and forth, giving the illusion that they were going somewhere when in fact they were simply biding their time. They were doing the same things they had always done in the same ways they had always done them without much excitement or passion or even 
understanding of why they were doing what they were doing. It reminds me of the story of a young couple, newly married. The young, the, the, one, one of them decides they want to make a meal together, so they, they, we're going we're gonna to cook a ham. And so uh, they're working together in the kitchen. The wife gets a knife out, and she cuts off the end of the ham. And the husband asks her, why'd you, why'd you cut the end off the ham? She said, I don't know. My mom always did it. That's the way she did it. That's the way she taught me. So they call her mom. They say, Mom, why, why do you cut the ends off the ham? The mom said, I don't know. That's the way my mom taught me. <laughs> well, Grandma's still alive, so they call her up. Grandma, why do you cut the ends off the ham? She, she exasperatedly exclaimed into the phone, Oh, you're still doing that? I did that because the pan I had to cook it in was small, and I had to cut it to fit in the pan. We like routine, and sometimes it's easy for us to overlook the reality that God is always doing new things. And, and it is our challenge and responsibility to respond to the new things that God is doing in our world and in our community so that we can have a greater kingdom impact. But that ad- adaptation is not always easy because change is hard. Mark Twain said the only one that likes change is a baby with a dirty diaper. And sometimes they could care less. I can tell you with a grandson that's still in diapers. They don't care if their diaper's dirty sometimes, but sometimes they do. Change is difficult, but it's necessary for us to fulfill the mission that God's entrusted to us to lead people to become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. That church that that young man was gathered in found, rather than a team of friends, that they appeared to be a gathering of isolated individuals. And so the young man went to the pastor a little bit frustrated and and asked him, when do we get to the good stuff? The pastor was kind of confused and curious. He said, what exactly is it that you're talking about? What do you have in mind? And, And this young recovering addict said, all the stuff in the book of Acts about people going out to change the world. The pastor replied, well... What you see, this is, this is pretty much all we do around here. And the convert, the, the converted addict responded to him, you mean I gave up drugs for this? You see, based on a reading of the book of Acts, that new disciple knew that there's something more to life as a disciple of Jesus Christ than simply sitting in a pew on a Sunday morning, being a nice person, and adding a little bit of religion to a resume. It's about becoming something more than simply trained and experienced consumers of religious goods and services. It's about becoming a movement of the spirit that impacts the world, not a monument to some religious belief or particular location. See, he sensed that the church has been called to the great task of being the living expression of God's kingdom as we are He also realized it was so big that it cannot be accomplished by a mere gathering of isolated individuals. He knew that being in community with other disciples was the only way that the early Christians were equipped to accomplish the mission that Jesus had given them to make a transformative difference in the world. Luke paints in that passage from Acts chapter 2 a wonderful picture of the way the early Christians shared their lives together. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the community, to their shared meals, and to their prayers. A sense of awe came over everyone. God performed many wonders and signs through the apostles. All the believers were united and shared everything. They would sell pieces of property and possessions and distribute the proceeds to everyone who needed them. Every day they met together in the temple and ate in their homes. They shared food with gladness and simplicity. They praised God and demonstrated God's goodness to everyone. And the Lord added daily to the community those who were being saved. You see, together they understood the power of the Holy Spirit as they experienced it in that moment. And they shared an uncommon mission. They centered their life in an uncommon ritual. And they practiced an uncommon generosity. And so let's break those down one at a time. The very first one of those is they they committed to an uncommon mission. That's number one on your fill in the blanks. They committed to an uncommon mission. 
You see, the early Christians were ordinary, imperfect people that were used by God to make a revolutionary difference because they were united in sharing a, a, a commitment to an uncommon, exceptional mission. Their, their life together now became centered in the words and the story of Jesus that were passed on through the apostles' teaching. They were bound together in the, com in the commitment that they had received and the, the witness that they had received from the risen Christ, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. This fierce commitment to an uncommon mission kept them united when things tried to tear them apart. In Acts chapter 15, there was a big dispute that rose within the, the early church's leaders about whether or not Gentiles would be included in this new thing that God was doing through Jesus Christ. And a great dispute rose up among them, but Peter came and offered the witness of, of the vision that he had, and others shared a similar story, and Paul was in the mix there uh, and, and, and shared what he felt God was doing, and finally they, they prayed together and they came to an agreement that this is truly something that God was doing. Something that could have driven a, a wedge between them and torn them completely apart, was kept from doing so because they understood the, the, the greater mission that God had called them to, and they began to expand their understanding of what God was maybe doing in the world. The mission that they held was strong enough to keep people with equally strong but differing convictions in community with one another. It wasn't like all of a sudden, just the, you know, the ones that were saying, no, the Gentiles aren't included yet, suddenly went, oh, okay, since you say so. No, this was, this was a, a, a conflict that arose within them. And there was conversation and, I'm sure, passion in the room. And so they prayed together and they stayed together in community and they worked it out. And because they stayed together and they worked it out, you and I have received the gift of the gospel of Jesus Christ for the world. Because folks, realize it or not, we're all Gentiles. So that dispute that rose in the early church was about whether or not we get included. Aren't you glad that we are? Aren't you glad the wisdom of the Spirit prevailed and they were, they were sensitive and discerning enough to listen to it and respond in obedience? You see, John Wesley described this pattern of life about unity, staying together, even though you have differences of opinion about other things. He said, though we cannot, this is a quote from John Wesley, though we cannot think alike, can we not love alike? May we not be of one heart, though we are not of one opinion? Without all doubt, we may. Herein, all children of God may be united, notwithstanding these smaller differences. These remaining as they are, they may forward one another in love and in good works. Though we might disagree, can we not love alike? It comes back to John Wesley's rule. It's a simple rule that says, in essentials, unity, and non-essentials, liberty or freedom, but in everything love. Love is to guide everything that we do. The ways that we interact with others, the way that we live our lives, the way that we do the ministry that's entrusted to us, the ways even that we have conflict and disagreements. Love should be at the center. And it's not some wishy-washy, willy-nilly, emotional kind of love. It's the power of a holy love that was witnessed in the sermon of, the Bish of Bishop Curry at the royal wedding last weekend that everybody went gaga over. The only part I saw was that sermon, and it's the best sermon that I have heard in decades even about the power of love and its ability to transform our world. Love is central. Love is at the core. Love is what keeps us united together in our uncommon mission of making disciples and making a difference, a transformative difference in the world. And you'll notice the second thing that they did, and this is number two on your fill in the blanks, they observed an uncommon ritual. 
They observed an uncommon ritual. You see, every team, organization, or movement shares common rituals that reinforce their identity and mission, and, and it makes their identity and mission something that's known to those both outside and inside. And it becomes formative for that group of individuals. Looking in from the outside, people must have been very surprised by the uncommon ritual that these early Christians held in common. In fact, it was one of the reasons why a lot of people persecuted them because they were accused of cannibalism because as they, as they celebrated Holy Communion or the Eucharist, as they celebrated the Eucharist together, they would say, this is the body of Christ and this is the blood of Christ. It was uncommon. It was weird. But... What happened is those first early meals that they shared together became the Eucharist and Holy Communion, and it became a shared ritual that held them together, defined their identity, and empowered them for service because now we know that the Eucharist is central to our mission because it puts in front of us a constant reminder of God's great love as it's been expressed through the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that when we want to see what love looks like, we need simply to look in the face of Christ as he hangs from the cross to die for our sins. That is what God's love looks like. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four 24 through 26, the Apostle Paul says this about Holy Communion. He said, after giving thanks, he broke the bread and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this to remember me. And he did the same thing with the cup after they had, eated, say, after they had eaten, saying, this, is, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Every time you drink it, do this to remember me. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you broadcast the death of the Lord until he comes. You put before yourself the death of the Lord. Why did he die? So that we could have life. And it's in this remembrance, this, simp this obedience to this simple act with these simple elements that God does something that is miraculative and transformative in our lives. Wesley saw the ritual of Holy Communion as the source of strength for the fulfillment of our calling. And over the course of his lifetime, a mentor of mine who's a Wesley studies expert has said it, it, that as best as he could tell through the extensive research that he's done, Wesley celebrated Holy Communion an average of 1.8 times per week. We get fussy if we do it more than once a month sometimes. But that's okay. That's a part of our tradition. And maybe, maybe it's time for us to, to, to think about the ways that this can become central to us and to our life together and begin to practice it more often than simply once a month. See, the sacrament empowers us to be the agents of God's love in the world. It is the ritual that binds us together and then sends us out from the table to find our way to serve. Then we, because we remember the death of Jesus Christ, that he gave his life for our sins, and that we are called to take up our own cross and give ourselves in service to the kingdom of God so that the world might know the love of God through Jesus Christ as we have. Don't, get, don't discount the ordinary gifts in your life that God can use in an extraordinary way. You see, when you begin to discount God's ability to work in your life simply based upon your own self-perceptions of your limitations or lack of giftedness, your focus is entirely in the wrong place. Because what God call, the God who calls us See, our, our focus should be on the one who calls us and equips us, and he makes us what we need to be so that we can make a difference in this world. You see, in the same way that God took the ordinary shepherd's staff in Moses' hand in Exodus 4.17 and turned it into a serpent, in the same way that Jesus took, blessed, and broke and gave the ordinary gifts on that Passover table, God is able to take whatever we have in our hands and use it for a kingdom purpose with no exceptions. In the sacrament of Holy Communion, we are reminded that God takes the ordinary of this world, infuses it with his spirit and his presence, 
and makes it something more. And that is true for you and for me. Now, the third thing that they did in that early church is they practiced an uncommon generosity. They practiced an uncommon generosity. See, the uncommon generosity of the early church is just as common today as it, uncommon today as it was in the first century. The extravagant generosity described in Acts 2 becomes practical action just two chapters afterwards in Acts chapter 4. It says this, The community of believers was of one heart and mind. None of them would say this is mine about any of their possessions, but they held everything in common. There were no needy persons among them. Those who owned properties or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds from the sales and place them at the care and under the authority of the apostles. Then it was distributed to anyone who was in need became such a characteristic marker of that early church that God was using this in such a distinctive way that we get the story just a few verses later of Ananias and Sapphira. Who went and sold something that they had and, and only gave a portion of the proceeds to make themselves look good and, and it cost them both their lives. I don't mean that to, to, to try to th make you think that if you don't do everything exactly right, God's going to get you. But I think that story was given to us for a reason to show us that our motivations need to be looked at in giving what we give and the ways that we give. That we need to form, first and foremost be obedient to God in all of the ways that he calls us to give. Because see, our culture, our culture is largely driven by unmitigated self-serving greed and the distinguishing mark of discipleship in our age will certainly be the ways which we demonstrate an uncommon generosity that is the direct extension of the extravagant, self-giving generosity of our God. And it goes beyond simply our, our financial generosity, but also with the lavish generosity that we show when we welcome, forgive, support, or care for one another. John 13, 35 says, This is how everyone will know you are my disciples when you love each other. Jesus prayed for the church in John's, uh, John chapters 15 through 17, and one of the main tenets of that prayer is a prayer that we would be one with God and each other in such a way that the world would look at it and see that God is real because they see his reality in our loving and our living. But that's not a love that we can pull off on our own. It's not something we can muster up with our own strength. We have to have the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, giving us God's divine love, His strength and His power to invigorate us and give us the power that we need to love when it does not come natural to us. And it doesn't always come natural to us. Even after we say our yes to Jesus, there will be times when we are challenged. And so that drives us into the arms of our Savior, trusting in His grace, His power, and His love. Praying, oh God, I, I don't have love of my own here. Give me yours. Love through me in ways I cannot love on my own. And that kind of self-giving love will be the way that we give ourselves in service to the world. It's a tough world out there. If we try to make a difference on our own, we can easily become frustrated and want to quit. The transformation of the world is far too big and far too complex a mission for any of us to accomplish on our own. But we're not called to be solo performers. Ministry in the body of Christ is always a team sport. Jesus sent them out two by two, not one by one. Two by two in community to lay the groundwork for his coming ministry in those communities. See, we need the strength, the wisdom, and the accountability of a community 
to fulfill our calling. We follow our passion and find our place to serve in community with other disciples. And then in community, we go into the world together because we understand that if we want to go far, we need to go together. Would you pray with me? Oh, Lord, our God, in these moments, help us to see beyond ourselves. Remind us that we're not in this alone, that, that the gift of community is just that. It's a gift. It's not something that is a burden. It's not something that we simply tolerate but wish it were otherwise, but it is a gift, and it's a life-giving gift. And so, Lord, fill us now with your Holy Spirit. For we want to, we want to be your followers who, who gather around an uncommon mission and celebrate an uncommon ritual and express an uncommon generosity. A generosity that's centered and has its origins in you. And so in order for that to happen, we have to give up control of our own lives to you. And so, Lord, we, say, we pray this simple prayer today of surrender. Lord, as far as I know my own heart, I'm willing for you to take this from me. This self-centeredness, this selfishness, I'm willing for you to take away from me anything that would keep me from loving and becoming the generous follower of Christ that you are calling me to be. Take my life, Lord. It's no longer my own, but it's yours. Thank you that Jesus offers me new life. Fill me with that life and, your, and the power of your Holy Spirit that I might, that I might become love expressed for the world so that others might come to know the great love that you have for them. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Our last hymn is to the tune of Onward Christian Soldiers. Let's stand.
I hope at the conclusion of the service that you'll join us in the Fellowship Hall as we uh, celebrate Marilyn's retirement uh, with a reception. Um, and uh, that will be a wonderful time, and I hope you'll uh, make the space for it in your schedules this morning. Now, as you go from this place, may the light, the power, the love, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit dwell within you, empower you, and enliven you as you go forth to be God's love for the world. Amen. Amen.